So I'm gonna go ahead and click on start. All right. Uh, so um, welcome to the presentation. <laughs> the presentation is called Ethics and Game Design. Uh, and I decided to put a little arcade, a nostalgic arcade in the background. Um, that's how we're gonna start this today. So very brief introduction. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you saw my bio already, um, but specifically, I just wanted to let you know, I teach game design, I teach game studies. I also, I'm, I'm a philosophy professor primarily, <laughs> um, but I'm very much involved uh, in the gaming industry because I just, I just took on the co-chair position for ISTE um, Games and Simulation Network. So basically we have about almost 3,000 educators now using games and simulations in their classroom from, from uh, it's basically K-20. So from, from high school all the way to college, all the graduate school. So it's a network of people trying to do this work. Um, and I'm also on the steering committee uh, for um, International Game Developers Association Learning Education and Games, uh, SIG. So what we're trying to do is work with professional game developers who are interested in making games for educational purposes. Um, I also evaluate games. So that's kind of the multiple hats that I take on, but it's mostly in the gaming industry. Um, and I just recently, besides being part of IEEE, I just took on, um, just a couple of weeks ago, the OER council member position for this uh, Colorado state government, uh, particularly for the Colorado Department of Higher Education. So I'm pretty darn busy right now, but just giving you background so you know, I'm not just someone who's interested in games, but I teach it and I work with it and so forth, okay? So there's a table of contents to this. <laughs> I like to put my little table of contents. So there's four main sections. Uh, first, I'm gonna give you a very brief introduction to game design. It's pretty complicated as a discipline. And many people think it's just doodling and drawing stuff and you make your game, but it's really complicated. Um, then we're gonna go dive into this concept called dark patterns. Some of you might know what they are already in the computer science field, but it's fairly new in the discussion regarding games. And there are a lot of dark patterns in games right now. Then I'm going to talk about reason legislation that are trying to fight against dark pattern games. So there's already a reaction from Congress folks who are uh, noticing problems in the game industry. And then lastly, like all of my presentations, I don't just present a bunch of problems. I always try to present solutions. So that's kind of my job. So those are my four sections, okay? All right, first section. Don't know if anyone recognizes that. Uh, that is Summerest 3. One of the best, my opinion, one of the best uh, puzzle games uh, available on desktop and mobile. So it's one of, I, I'm kind of a big fan of the studio. And if you can't tell, that's a mushroom and there's little people, you know, writing, whatever, whatever that's called, okay. <laughs> writing the swings on it. So this first section, I'm going to give you a definition of game and I'm going to discuss ethical rules of game design, at least according to myself, what those rules should be, okay? First step, let's talk about what exactly is a game through a philosophical lens. You have to expect that because I do teach philosophy, so we're gonna start it that way, okay? So there's a book called Homo Ludens, uh, published, technically it was first published in 1944, but the version I got a hold of is 19, you know, republished in 1949. Uh, it was written by Dutch historian and cultural theorist, Johan Housinga, okay? So he's, he's, he's from uh, the Netherlands. And he made this big argument that, that basically became the foundation for a field called game studies, okay? And his big argument is that an act of play is an act of experimentation. So when you think of play, play entails fun, but the question is, why is it fun? And what he thinks plays are, are basically energy for experimentation, okay? And what are we experimenting? We're trying to figure out what is possible. If you see a child play, they're always trying to figure out another way to break the rule or make a rule up or do something different, see what happens instead. So that's what he thinks play is, okay? So the spirit of play is to experiment. And another part of his argument is that play acts basically, and this is a bigger chunk, created all cultures and civilization. 
Now, it might, might sound crazy, but he's going to tell you, well, play, the act of play precedes civilization, which is the construction of cities, construction of people with law and society, right? That's because his evidence is, if you look at the animal kingdom, and we're animals, right? I'm an animal, you're an animal. If you look at the animal kingdom, all animals play. They all play. If you see a human baby, they play. It precedes this idea of construction of society. And he thinks it's because the fact that we play, that we have culture. It's because we play that we actually create a civilizations. Through play, we create norms and values through that. So it's a pretty big philosophy on how human beings came about. That's what he thinks it is. Another term that he gives us is that he thinks cultures are basically magic circles, okay? So on the right-hand side is a picture. It's, it's not, the, <laughs> not the most exciting picture, but um, it's, it's titled Rondell with playing at Quinteng, and it's circa 1500. Basically what that is, uh, Quint Rondell is a type of game where knights would stand on one, one foot and use the other foot to kind of kick the other person's foot to try to move that person off balance. So it's a balancing game to kind of check each other's balancing game. And that game is, even though there's only two people in that photo or in, <laughs> in that artwork, there's only two people there. It's a type of magic circle because magic circle means there's this magical circle that we enter together and there's a set of rules that we decide to follow. And if you decide not to follow those rules, you're out of the circle. You can't continue to play. So he's going to say that culture is basically a magic circle that enforces a system of rules that one must follow to play within its boundary. So if you don't want to follow the rules, for example, the society might have a rule that says, do not kill your neighbors. <laughs> and you as a person decide not to ignore that. Well, society has a way to, to move you to the fringe of society, which is usually prison, right? So that's why culture has its own rules and you're supposed to follow it if you want to be part of that culture. So a game, whether it's digital or physical is a cultural artifact, right? And it represents a magic circle and it represents the rules of culture. A game also has its own rule system um, and players must follow the rules in order to play and maintain and stay in that game. So in many ways, a, a game is a culture and when we decide to play a game, we are basically saying we accept and abide by the, the rules of that culture. So that's the philosophy side. Now moving quickly from philosophy um, into the ethics in game design, okay? So in game design, the modern definition of, of games, okay? A game is defined as a system of affordances and constraints in relation to goals. Affordances are actions that a player can take and constraints are limits or roadblocks to goal completion. And the whole point of doing game design is to create a system of playful challenges uh, that will, willing participants, and I should emphasize the word willing, which is they have to be willing to participate, otherwise it's kidnapping, okay? That they'd be willing to participate in the rules so they can actually make decisions that feel meaningful to them. That's the whole point of creating a game. So whether you're making a board game, or a physical game, you know, a, a party game, poker game, whatever kind of game, you have to be willing to create challenges and that other person has to be willing to enter into agreement with you to play that game. So here's what I suggest an ethical game design should be, an ethical game should do, okay? One is that it recognizes a player's will and autonomy by revealing all of its rules. So I, as a person, can affect my will or autonomy, right, or express my autonomy if I don't know what the rules are. I can't possibly decide to join a game if I don't know what the rules are. So that's number one. Number two is that a game should be designed to satisfy players' psychological needs to experiment and learn. So if we go into the field of game studies a little more, you will quickly learn that basically all games are there for people to learn to get better at doing something. Because a game by the very basic definition is a, it's a rule system with a bunch of challenges. And you have to follow the rules and do the challenges. And then somehow you master it, then you move on. 
That's what a game is, okay? And three, it should provide affordances such as a story. So a story, the basic definition of story is a series of events that lead to a problem, right? So a game should provide affordances such as a story that allows the player to wrestle with the game's cultural message. So a game can't help but express the cultural messages that it reflect. Sometimes the cultural messages come from the developers. Sometimes the game is designed to reflect some kind of social ill. It's kind of like books, right? Physical books reflect society. So do video games. And I think an ethical game should be designed in such a way so that the player has moment to reflect and go, why did I just do that? Should I have done that? What is this game trying to tell me? I think all games should be doing this. So on the right hand side, you probably can figure out that's Minecraft. And in Minecraft, you go grab, you know, uh, you know, land and sea materials. So you would go out and, and uh, uh, dig up tree, tree trunks or, or soil to make something out of that with a bunch of combination. So that's the example of affordance, which is the land have a bunch of resources and Minecraft, those are affordances. And when you're encountering things like spiders, zombies, skeletons, those are the uh, constraints, the limitations that prevent you from finishing a goal. Because honestly, if there's no constraints, you don't have a game. It's just a bunch of procedures that you're doing, right? Okay, so now psychology is a very big part of making games ethical. In fact, modern game design pretty much, I'm gonna say, instead of saying modern, I would say that triple A studios. So triple A studios refer to big game studios that are making more than probably a hundred million dollars um, of one of their games, okay? Uh, they're the ones that are basically very, very concerned about applying psychology to game design. Part of it is because they figured out that if you don't hire a, a, a game developer that has some psychology background, right, some chump training in psychology, or if you don't hire professional psychologists, you won't be able to figure out how to apply theories to, to make the player happy, because that's what games are. It's designed to, to make the, uh, the, the, satisfy the player needs while providing a bunch of challenges. Um, and a player who doesn't feel like a game is satisfying some kind of need will quit the game. We have heard rage quit before. People quit the game because the game is either too hard and it goes beyond what they need, right? Or that the game is too easy and it's boring them to tears. So they will quit a game. So if you don't understand player psychology, then your game will not be able to retain players. And in modern times, no game is a one-off commercial off the shelf game anymore. Pretty much all games have the streaming, go through streaming service and is expected to be updated. Unless we're talking about small independent games, which is a whole different story, okay? So there are two theories I will discuss, two main theories. In my own game design courses, students need to know at least, you know, 25 theories, right? I'm just talking about two major ones that a lot of gaming studios apply. The first one is called flow theory. And that is uh, flow theory was discovered or named by Mihai Chicks and Mihai in 1975. So Mihai Chicks and Mihai uh, was the founder, the, the psychology who founded positive psychology. He also happened to be the person um, with another uh, professor who founded the term flow theory. Flow theory is based on his 40 years of research interviewing people about what exactly made them happy. And instead of figuring out what makes people happy, he discovered something else through those 40 years of research, okay? So what he discovered was that in the mind, there is a mental state called flow. And flow is when one loses a sense of time and space when one is really obsessed with doing an activity that one finds interesting, okay? So I don't know if you've experienced this, I experienced this plenty. For example, while I was doing this set of slides, uh, I sat here for what, eight hours? <laughs> I forgot to drink water. I forgot that I forgot to eat, right? Sometimes you, you, get, you get into a mode, you get into a zone, and that's actually called the psychological state of flow. And what he figured out was in order for a person to stay in this flow so they can get better at doing something, Basically, she has to, this, this person had to find an activity that's both challenging 
and also appropriate for her skill level. So if you take a look at that little chart on the right-hand side, it's not the most exciting chart, but on the vertical axis, you can see it says challenges, right? So challenges from low to high. So when it go up and vertical, that means the challenge rise up to the occasion, okay? The skill uh, on the horizontal axis from left to right, and that means the skill progress increasingly. Now the flow channel is the white part, the, the, the channel in the middle, right? That's in the center that goes diagonal. What that white channel is basically saying is that the challenge, the difficulty of challenge have to correlate with the player's skill set. If the challenge is too easy, the player snaps out flow state, right? If the challenge is too difficult, the player will also snap out flow state because they can't figure out how to solve it. This is why for game designers, it's a really big task to figure out how to get a player to get into that middle flow channel. Now I have lots of design tricks for doing that, but that's just the basic concept that we learned from Mihai Chicks and Mihai. He is not a game developer. Game developers just borrow this theory from his psychology, okay? Another term that's really important to know that pretty much all modern game designers use now is self-determination theory. Um, now self-determination theory is a framework that's been around since 1970. So it's been around for a long time, but there are two researchers Desi and Ryan that came up with a version of self-determination theory in 1985 that we basically all use now because it's un easy to understand and it applies to a lot of things. And self-determination uh, theory is studying the human motivation for wanting to do anything. So it's a motivational theory study. Why do we want to do stuff, right? And what they basically argue is that a person is motivated, intrinsically motivated, which is I want my, I actually psychologically want to do something. You didn't force me to do that. You didn't, you didn't uh, coerce me with candy or manipulate me with money. I want to do this thing, right? The three factors are, I want autonomy. So I want to do something for autonomy. I want to do something because it helped me reach competence and something to get better at something. And the last one is related this, which is I want to be able to relate to other people. Even if someone says, oh, I don't, you know, I don't like people. They will find a way to relate to people, whether it is an anime <laughs> or somebody directly on Instagram or TikTok. So people will try to relate to each other. So for Desi and Ryan, the real key, right, the secret to self-determination theory, where one is motivated to do something without anyone prodding them, is that the person want autonomy, confidence, or relatedness, okay? So those are basic breakdown of those two theories, and it's used very broadly in game design. All right. I thought South Park was appropriate. If you guys remember, South Park did a whole episode on free-to-play games. I thought, why not? Let me just put it in there. So currently, there's a rise of free-to-play games. Um, and that's creating a whole bunch of ethical problems in game design, okay? So free-to-play games, which is also, you know, the, the abbreviation is F2P, is a modern term for something that's been around since 1980s, which is the freemium model. So freemium model doesn't just apply to games, it applies to all apps, which is that the player or the user can use an application or software for free, but they want additional features they have to pay for it, right? So they have to pay money for it. Features or services and so forth. So in modern game design with for uh, F2P games, you're pay, paying a premium in order to enhance your gaming experience. Now, here's the bad part. Some, I really should say a lot of them, but I just wrote some there. A lot of F2P games are designed with dark patterns, okay? And dark patterns, essentially are there to obfuscate game rules, which is I as a player want to know all the game rules in order to decide if I want to participate in a game. But dark patterns is designed in such a way that some of the rules are hidden from me and I have no idea those rules are there, okay? And I enter into it, basically robbing me of my autonomy. So sometimes I make choices when I don't really know all the rules, I make choices that are against my own self-interest. That is an example of how dark patterns work. So the ethical problem that we're left with, well, two problems specifically, is can a player participate in a game with their own will and autonomy? 
if some game rules are hidden from her and violate her expectations. How can we do that? I mean, I don't know all the rules. I don't know what to expect. So how can I make smart decisions? So let's discuss a bit about dark game design patterns. Now, I do want to preface this by saying that there are literally close to a hundred dark uh, patterns. I mean, as we see new games being developed, we, we spot them. Um, obviously, I can't go over a hundred of them. So I decided to select a few to show you what we mean by dark pattern. They're not just mathematical formula, but you can actually spot their characteristics and say, ah, I remember playing this game that contained this particular dark pattern, okay? All right, so first let's discuss what exactly is a dark game design pattern. So uh, three famous game studies theorists, Zagal, Bjork, and Lewis in 2013 have categorized a whole bunch of dark game design patterns into three major types. The first time is called temporal dark patterns, which basically punish the player for not grinding, which is grinding is the idea that you're going into the game and you're doing a bunch of silly tasks, right? So it's like very, very time consuming in order to get some kind of reward. And temporal dark patterns sometimes is set up so that there's a schedule, you're forced to follow the game schedule, even though you have real life issues, but the game is forcing you to waste time inside itself. That's called temporal dark pattern. Monetary dark pattern is doing whatever the game design game dev does that deceive the player to spend more money than they actually expected to, to spend. So they, the player might have an idea, I'm not going to spend more than 10 bucks on this game this month. And at the end of the month, they go, oh my God, I spent $500. That happens. <laughs> okay. Social dark patterns is coercing the player into participating in a game in order to maintain social standing. So let's say you have a group of people playing together, maybe you're with your family or, or, or friends, and you decided not to get on the game today, your family member might call you up and go, wait, hey, hey, you're supposed to be playing with us today. You're supposed to be part of the team. We're supposed to go kill that monster together or that Titan together. Why are you not there? That is called a social dark pattern, but we'll go, we'll go deeper into that. So these are three major categories. I also want to preface our discussion by saying that what makes a pattern dark has to do with the game developer's intention. So the game developer might not have intended to make a dark pattern, but they actually make one. Sometimes that happens, okay? So we can always try to educate game developers who don't notice that they're doing this by helping them convert dark patterns into ethical patterns. So it's possible every type of dark pattern I will show you can be converted into ethical ones. And on the right-hand side, I hope you guys recognize that. Um, that's the Untitled Goose game. That was crazy last year. Everyone played that game. I would think every time I see the goose, I think of him as a darn dark, dark pattern. That's what I think. He's like an embodiment of that. So I'm just gonna move on <laughs> from this slide and do the next one. All right, so let's talk a bit about grind. We know already that grind is basically a bunch of game tasks that the game forced you to do so you can get a reward. The reason why it's a dark pattern in the sense that it's unethical is because the when a player plays a game and we go back to the self-determination theory, the reason why we play a game is to reach some kind of competence in something. So we learn a skill, we get better at something. But grinding doesn't really teach you anything. <laughs> you're doing mundane tasks or the same rep repetitive task, right? So you're doing over and over again the same task. You're not really developing your skill. You're just wasting time because the game wants you to waste time. So it's, you know, you, the longer you stay in the game, the more likely you will spend money on the game, see? So that's what those repetitions are about. So that's a type of uh, horrible grind uh, scenario. Now, Lewis also noted that, uh, it's interesting because why do people do grinding anyway? Because grinding is so very, very boring and mundane, right? So why do people do it? That's because people like to follow a schedule. We, we have an internal clock, okay? Human beings have like an internal clock. We have a sense of time. Um, and this time is actually related to 
our, our uh, there's neuroscience research regarding what we think time is. Time might not actually exist in reality, as in physics, right? Time might not exist. But internally, we actually have an internal clock that's related to our heartbeats. And also there is a sense of clock in the brain. So it's very interesting what we think time is. But the idea is that we have a clock in our head, just metaphorically speaking, and we like things that have a schedule. So when a game clearly dis, uh, lists a schedule, which is, it will say uh, one hour or 60 minutes before the next monster show up, you wait for it. You like seeing that time. So there are some research that suggests that people do grinding because if the game has schedule pointed out, people like staring at it. We're weird like that, okay? Um, other things, yeah, we, we kind of discussed already, which is it's just getting reward. So on the right-hand side from uh, Dark Pattern Games, and I honestly, I've, done, I, I've been searching throughout this site for a while. I can't find who the author is, but I can, I can bet a good amount of money that's Lewis who secretly created that site because the site basically just grabbed his dissertation that he did in 2013 and put it on the site in a site format. So I bet Lewis did the site, but he offered three examples of mobile games that basically put the grind in there. So you have, for example, need for speed, low limits. And he says, must collect lots of parts to upgrade the car. Only certain races have the part you want. So it's not, it's not skill-based, it's just waiting. Like right? you're waiting forever to get a part so you can upgrade your car. Call of Duty Mobile, to complete missions, you have to play certain game mods many times. That sounds super annoying to me. I don't wanna play that. So let's just move on. All right, so another, the second type, uh, second temporal dark pattern is playing by appointment. So playing by appointment is also known as interaction by demand. It forces users to interact with the app application on its own schedule. So it doesn't care if you have a schedule, your schedule doesn't matter. The game says you need to be here between two to you know, 12 o'clock to, to do this particular mission and you have to be there, right? This is pretty awful because well, some people's life, um, life schedule gets messed up. This is what we talk about people having addiction to a game, which is they're on there all the time because they're trying to follow the game schedule and they're worried that if they don't follow the schedule, they'll miss out. So it's kind of a punishment to not get certain rewards by not following the, the schedule that the game has set out, right? So uh, example, right? So Dark Pattern since player unlisted. So th here's an example. The Dark Pattern specifically if you have a mobile, you guys can't see my screen. <laughs> I have a mobile phone, right? So I have game installed in my phone and all of a sudden the game give me a notification and go, oh my gosh, you haven't logged in for three hours. You should log in now. That is an example of playing by appointment. There is no reason why I must log in within the three hours that you set. I have a life, I teach, I have stuff to do. But the game is saying that their schedule is more important than mine. See, so it's forcing me to get back into the game, okay? Um, and that's the kind of punishment. And I want to also get, get everyone's uh, set of eyeballs to, to the, the last um, paragraph there where it says, the game offers rewards on a variable ratio uh, release schedule. So there's two type of release schedules in games. One is called fixed ratio, right? Fixed ratio release schedule, which is the game says, uh, the reward will appear every two hours. So if you log in and you go, oh, I expect it, it will show up at two, then we'll show up at four o'clock, then we'll expect at six o'clock and so forth. That's called a fixed ratio schedule. Variable ratio schedule feels random, which is sometimes it appears, sometimes it doesn't appear. So you need a carrot to feed your rabbit, but sometimes the carrot might show up five hours later, maybe it'll show up tomorrow. Why do people, why do game developers use variable ratio release schedule? on a F2P game? Well, that's because there's the element of surprise. I might log in like every five minutes to see if the, the carrot shows up. So it works with people's addiction. This is pretty bad. I do want to say one thing, not everyone who play games become addicted. That is wrong. That is completely wrong. Addiction actually has to do with one's personality. So if you don't have the personality for your addiction, even if I put you in front of Vegas, right? And go, go to a casino, you might not be throwing down $5,000 at, at a machine. There's a reason for that, okay? And there are some people, if they have addiction to games, 
if you get them in front of, for example, uh, a pile of apple, they might eat themselves over uh, overindulge in apples, or they see chocolate cake, or they see television. Those are the people with personality that tend to gravitate toward addiction. So I don't want anyone to think that just because there's a game, we all get addicted. That's a very simplistic way to understand how addiction works. And there's some example there. So I'm going to move on because we kind of discussed that. And there's a schedule I have to keep. <laughs> so monetary dark pattern um, is a type of currency. Uh, this one is called currency confusion, which is when you make the player switch real money and exchange it for virtual currency. Now, why do game developers make you do that? First of all, when you convert it to a virtual currency, it's called a global currency, which is players in India, player in Australia, players in America, players in China can recognize how much that currency is because it's global. Okay, everyone knows how much that is. So it's kind of easy to use and purchase items in exchange if you have a global currency. Um, but the, the problem is when you do that, players tend to have a very low understanding of actually what things cost. And you can see it if you've ever been on vacation with someone and they try to exchange money or maybe you experience this, which is you exchange your money into, let's say you go to India, you exchange into rupees. In rupee, the number is much larger because of you know, our, the currency exchange, right? Our, our money is more valuable. So rupee, you're going to get a lot of rupees and some people don't know how to interpret that. That's called currency confusion. We know from research already too that there's also a psychological effect called anchoring. So anchoring is the brain laziness, if you will, okay? Laziness to say, if I see a value, I see a number, my brain is going to try to look for the highest or the lowest absolute value so that I don't have to calculate the number. So here's an example. I gave you two examples. In terms of object, a magic potion shop places a cheap item next to an expensive item. So extremes, right? So this way you think that the cheap item is really, really bargain, right? It, it might not be, but it's just placed next to each other as a trick. Grocery stores do this, okay? Shopping malls do this. It's a trick. Uh, another way is, let's say you see a big number. So, uh, so a player sees a big number. So they exchange their physical money into virtual money. And a lot of them don't really know what that number really represents. So they look at the, the first number and the last number, or the biggest number and the smallest number to say, oh, that's a lot of money. It sounds silly, but a lot of us make these kind of errors. Okay. So some of the example there, Candy Crush Saga. Goodness, gold is the name of the game's premium currency. It's intentional. It's trying to confuse you. It's trying to say your money actually is worth gold. It's not. And also the, the denomination, usually put one, one dollar and it'll become, you know, 10,000 10, coins. That's because it's trying to confuse you. So you don't know exactly how much you're spending. Okay. All right. So another monetary dark pattern is called monetized uh, rivalry. Sounds exactly like what it is. It's also known as pay to win. So you see your in, in an MMO, particularly in an MMO, you're in an alliance, you're playing with other people. You see that someone is 15 levels ahead of you. You become competitive. They're logging in every day. They're bragging about their, their advanced levels, right? So you might spend money so that you can advance faster. That's called monetized rivalry. <laughs> so a couple, couple of examples of physical things that you can think about, which is pretty much all games have a leaderboard. So leaderboard came out of the arcades back in the day. So if you play, Mar uh, not Mario Brother, uh, Pac-Man, I remember the flat table Pac-Man. I like to play those flat table Pac-Man. When I play the game, it will automatically place me like on 10th spot or 7th spot or whatever. And there's always the, the, the guy that's on top. The truth is outside of the game, it doesn't mean anything, right? It doesn't help me get a raise. It doesn't improve my life. It's just some kind of scoreboard. But people really, really want to put their name on that scoreboard. They see that leaderboard and go, I'm going I'm to spend more money in this, this Pac-Man machine, okay? It's the same principle in mobile games. You'll see those leaderboard. Almost every one of them has a leaderboard and it's there to trick you. Um, the other kind is the global announcement. So some games have global announcement, which is, Every time it sends a message, every player in the game can see the message. And it will say something like, uh, Johnny just up to, you know, finished the, the cave of bears at level 50. Good for him. 
So you go, oh my God, Johnny, I'm jealous. Or Mary pulled the best hero from the collection. Lucky Mary. You're going, oh my God, I didn't pull that hero. I'm going to spend a hundred bucks and pull that hero. Monetized rivalry. So some example, like they have, I don't even know what Mobile Legends Bang Bang is, but Magic Chess Start like premium membership gets a slight advantage over non-paying players. So non-playing players are disadvantaged in this equation. Okay. We're switching to social capital now. So most people don't quite understand social capital, but let's explain a bit. So there are two types that I'm talking about. Social pyramid schemes. So pyramid scheme in reality was when you try to get family members and friends in an annoying fashion to pull them into your business and say, hey, I if you bite this off me, right? And then you can sell it. Then I get it. I get a particular interest from you selling this thing. You can sell it to 10 people and then you can sell it to 15 people. That's, that's a pyramid scheme. In games, you should have noticed if you ever touch a mobile game, or even if you play Farmville, the good old days at Farmville, um, or even Angry Birds, the game would sometimes say, hey, invite 10 friends. I'll give you gems. Or invite 100 people or give you a free spot in something. They'll, they'll, they'll try to coerce you to do that. That is because the more people join, the more money the game makes, right? So that is, that is a type of pattern that utilizes your social capital. So social capital means how wealthy you are with how many people you're friends with, right? How many people you're associated with. That's called social capital. Um, some game aggressively send notification to pressure the player to invite others. So sometimes I get a bunch of notification when I'm testing games, that's super annoying. And for family members and friends, your family members and friends, they don't really like you if you do that all the time. That's because they feel pressure. They go, ah, oh, man, you know, somebody invited me and I don't go join. I feel like I'm not being a good family member. So they join it unwillingly. That's not a really good relationship. So I usually do not invite anybody because that's annoying for me and I'm sure it's annoying for them. Uh, yeah. So, and lastly, the player may earn rewards, but they're not associated with player skills again. So going back to the, the uh, self-determination theory, this is kind of useless. It doesn't really help the player grow. So Star Trek Fleet Command, I'm just picking pieces now. They currently have a promotion for rewards for inviting your friends. Harry Potter Wizards Unite in the fortresses, higher level chambers can only be completed by playing with friends. See, they say you can't even play this level unless you have five friends here. Those are the kind of design that really, really, really annoys me. But that's called social pyramid scheme. One more and we'll stop here because I, I can't talk about all of them. Impersonation, I think, is by far the worst. And I think that it's almost always, almost always that the game devs are doing this intentionally to harm the player. So impersonation is also known as friend spam, okay? Basically, the game would impersonate the player and they will say something like, I'll use the Facebook example to help you understand this. So Facebook uh, got faced with a, got hit with a $20 million lawsuit for what they did. So a few years ago, John, going back to your memory bank, okay? I don't know if you ever saw this, but I will see something like David Johnson, your friend David Johnson just joined this group. And I go, why is this being notified to me? Like, why is this being told? Basically what Facebook was doing was they pretending to be David Johnson telling me something that David Johnson did, even though David Johnson didn't tell me that that's what he was doing, okay? And the effect is now I feel like I have to join that group because David Johnson did it. So it's called impersonating the player, which is I did not give you any, uh, you know, getting permission to reveal what I'm doing in the game. But the game would say, oh, Sherry is doing this thing and she's advancing five levels. It's very, it's very close to the global announcement we talked about, but it's also a type of impersonation. So you're impersonating somebody, you're basically tricking other people, right? And specifically I wrote there, impersonation tricks other by giving off the false impression that a player logs into the game more frequently than the player is able. So if I stop playing a game for five hours and the game keeps blasting announcement like, Sherry does this and Sherry did that, it really does give people the impression I play a lot more and other people might wanna be competitive and go, I need to log in. It's all pretty dark, okay? 
And unfortunately, the game Play Gink does this too. There's an option to infect your friends via Facebook. <laughs> so so you're, the game can do that for you, and that is impersonation. Okay. So I'm going to play for you. I don't know if anyone played this, and I would love to hear after my presentation, anyone plays this particular game. This game is called Empires and Puzzles. Uh, three years ago, when it came out, it reached number one spot on Google, the Google Play uh, Store. It's kind of a big deal. It's a free to play mobile game. And I'm just gonna play the trailer really quick. It's just 30, 30 seconds. Empires and Puzzles. Play now for free. All right. So why did I show you guys that? Uh, I've been doing research on this game. I play this game. But I'm, while I'm playing this game, I'm also doing research on it. And what we found out was this, right? So the game was released in March 2017. And it earned, by 2019, $260 million off 34 million installs. Only 34 million people installed it. And they made $260 million off that group of people. Why is that significant? We know from research that less than 10% of people on FTP games actually pay any money for it. And those who do pay out of that percentage, maybe like 2% out of that 10 are whales or maybe less, right? So it's really amazing that a little mobile game, which you saw that was nothing amazing really, made $260 million from 2017 to January of 2019. That is ridiculous, okay? So Zynga, the big player here, the big publisher in 2018 purchased Small Giant Games, a studio, 80% ownership of Small Giant Studio for $560 million because they estimate that this game is worth 700 million. That is very unheard of for mobile games. That's what I've been studying it for the last uh, few years. Oops, I did not mean to play it. I don't wanna see that again, sorry. <laughs> so let's discuss, and I know, Oh my gosh, I'm almost out of time. So let's discuss a little bit about some of the dark patterns as in empires and puzzles. So again, back to the dark pattern games, you guys will have uh, access to the set of slides after I finish talking. So you have all the access to every link that's in this presentation. So on this site, it allows people to vote on what they think is the most prevalent dark pattern. So under the temporal dark pattern section, Notice that playing by appointment is one of the big offenders. So are the daily rewards. So if people don't log in right away, they miss those things out and they feel like they're being punished by the game. Again, I can't talk about all these. Monetary dark patterns. I see that the one that is moted, voted the most, if you guys can see the little votes there, one is pay to skip, which is it takes forever to level up. It takes forever to get a hero. So some people get so annoyed with the long leveling that they pay money to skip levels, right? Um, also 20, gambling or loot boxes. There are boxes, you, know, you, you pay for it. You don't know if you're gonna get something that's five gems or 500 gems, you don't know. So those who like gambling like that kind of box, okay? Now we have social dark. I never got to psychological dark. There's just too many of them. But social dark, we kind of discussed it already. And apparently social pyramid is not the big factor, but social obligation to your guild, which I didn't talk about, but this sense of guilt that if you don't log in to help your alliance members, then you're a loser. I mean, that's, that's really how the game operates. Um, in psychological dark pattern, illusion of control, variable rewards, I'm not gonna get into that, but there's just a lot that you can study. And on this site, it's available to the public, okay? So quickly, we're gonna talk a bit about legislation against dark pattern games. So there are particularly two acts um, in recent years that were filed, that were, that aims to go against 
the gaming industry, okay? The first one was written by the famous, infamous, dare I say infamous Josh Hawley. I don't have to say who he is, right? I hope you guys know. But in May 23rd, 2019, he and uh, Blumenthal and Markey wrote, uh, wrote and introduced a Senate bill, 1629, known as Protect Children from Abusive Game Act. And basically this particular act aims to ban all loot boxes and pay to win microtransactions from games that are marketed to minors. Okay, that was its big intention. And there are lots of problems with this act. First of all, the, the language of the bill is so general and look at who's writing it. I don't wanna say much more detail, but the bill is written so generally that it seems not only applied to minor, uh, games that market to minorities, but also games that are marketed toward adults. So basically, if all loot boxes and microtransactions are removed, the gaming industry as we know it will completely crumble because most game studios can only make money using microtransactions. I mean, this is a big problem. And another problem is that this act never acknowledged or even know. It seems that the senators have no idea what dark game design patterns are. They didn't, I don't think they even actually spoke to a game developer. I don't think they were educated on this. So they have no idea about that side of the problem. So Gustein, uh, professor, law professor Gustein, offers a perspective to help us understand what's the big deal about removing all free to play, okay? So he says the cost of developing video games has skyrocketed over last 15 years. The cost of creating triple A games, which is, uh, you know, that rose from 20 to 30 million to over 100 million, and in some cases over 200 million. So if you are a company that require raising $20 million capital, it is not feasible to not charge people free to play because most people refuse to pay $80 up front, like the good old days, where we pay $80 for a game and we play for 60 hours and we're happy with it. People no longer want that. They want games that stream and can be updated quickly. There are people who support microtransactions and they argue that the FTP model affords players opportunity to continually request for improvement to the game. So that's why they think it's great because if the game is bad, they can keep talking to the developers and if the developer had time, they will, they will fix the game for them. So it's an expectation now. So game designer uh, Sean Plot offers League of Legends as an example because League of Legends is FT, FTP, F2P. And he says, League of Legends is actually 100% free to play, but it generated 1 billion last year in revenue. 1 billion, so this quote is from 2015. They made $1 billion in 2014. That is ridiculous, right? For a free to play game. People go, oh, it's free. Well, it's the fees and the services that you're paying for that bump up that number. So obviously they're doing very well with that system. Here's the counter to that, right? Microtransactions also give paying players, those who, play, who pay the money, unfair advantage over others. And also it can, the way they, they set things up, the paying players are basically breaking the game design. So Dr. Ellen Evers make this uh, analogy. That's kind of fun. So she says, uh, games in general, not just video games have their own set of norms and rules, as I discussed earlier with you, that you're supposed to follow. So it's not against the law to steal money from the bank and monopoly, but you're clearly you're violating the spirit of the game. <laughs> if you steal money from the monopoly bank, I mean, what are we actually doing, right? You can, but should you, right? So last bit here, I'm trying to, I, and I'm sorry if I'm a little bit slow. So the newer bill, it's much better in my opinion than the PCAGA, okay? This new bill is called Deceptive Experiences to Online Users Reduction Act, called DETOR Act. Um, it was introduced on in April 9th of 2019 by two senators, uh, Warner and Fisher. And what they were trying to do is very different than what PCAGA were doing. That's because it seems to me that the senators really, really did their research, and I'm very, I, I respect them for that. They went after dark patterns. So they didn't go after loot boxes. They didn't go after microtransactions. They realized that all these problems come from <laughs> dark game design patterns. They go, those are the things that are a problem. The other thing that's really great 
is that the detour bill will require the federal government to set up a, an oversight committee, right? A, a professional body oversight committee to basically monitor game companies, uh, pre present policy to improve uh, gaming environment. So it's not going and saying, we're just gonna destroy the game industry by removing all loot boxes and F2P, but our suggestion is that we want to have an oversight committee so that you're not going after children, especially games that, that prey on children. That's not cool, right? Children don't know how to decide. The problem with this particular act is that it's not passed yet. <laughs> this is, it, they got introduced, they haven't passed it yet. So we, we don't know if it's gonna pass. Also, it only goes after large online operators. So large online operators are defined as those with 100 million authenticated users, which is extremely rare that that ever happens. So that means there's a big swath of game dev companies that can create a bunch of games that have dark patterns and then can prey on young children who are just playing and you know spending $3,000 because they don't know what they're doing. That's a really awful thing. So this is not complete. So here's my, here's my big reflection on this, right? Okay, fine. So let's say PC, AGA and Detour Act do not pass, but this should be a warning for the entire gaming industry that they don't watch their own, you know, watch their own, regulate themselves. Eventually there's going to be another congressional bill that tried to take down the gaming industry because they keep thinking that loot boxes are gambling and that Games are really no different than going to Vegas and pulling a, a slot machine. They're seeing this relationship. So if the gaming industry is going to try to address this, it's going to go down in flames, okay? So here's the question though. The question still remains for us, which is, first of all, we talked about how much it costs to develop a game. Developers cost a lot of money. For many of you who are in the computer science field, engineering, you know how much people get paid yearly to do the job. So. If the gaming industry relies on microtransaction to F2P to survive, and also the players expect that companies hire game devs that continually fix the code so that the game gets better, then can we really ask game studios to, start, to stop using the F2P model if that's the only way they can survive? So my proposal is very different than what's been out there, okay? I propose a different equation, specifically an equation that allows for that still recommend elimination of dark game design patterns, but allow F2P model to continue. So that sounds weird. I've been going after F2P all this time, but I'm saying, oh, it can stay, right? So how does this work? So here's the last section. I know I'm a little slow, but here's the last section. The future of game design, I say could be, but it's very well would be in blockchain technology and NFTs. Okay, so we'll, we'll discuss what that is. This video, I'm not going to play. I left it for you guys if you want to see it. I discussed the future of blockchain and game design back in 2016 when no one is even talking about it because I already can foresee what the relationship is between blockchain and games. Not to create games so people can farm coins. That, that, is, not my, that is not my interest at all. But let me explain to you what I see, okay? And the video is available. Oops, I didn't mean to start it. Oh my gosh. There you go. All right. Blockchain, quickly, blockchain is the underlying consensus algorithm for creation of such things as Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and those, the super famous crypto kitties, right? And specifically, it's a digital ledger that records and documents things and basically recognize the provenance of objects, at least of textual digital record of things. So for example, it can record who the creator of something is, the data creation, uh, publisher, data sale, data transfer owners and so forth. So it's very useful if you're trying to exchange goods between two people who are on blockchain. It's very useful for that. The each block of a blockchain records a hash value. And the current security is SHA-256. That is a derivative of SHA-2. Don't worry too much about it but the hash value kind of look like the picture on the right, okay? So you can see the input, you put mouse there, and then cryptographic hash functions. The, the hash function convert that text into SHA-256 hash value on the right-hand side. Don't try to decrypt it. That's just, <laughs> it's just, that's just the hash value. Don't worry about that. Um, but for the gaming industry, building games with blockchain and NFT can actually save it. 
um, users basically will be able to own virtual game assets instead of losing all the assets that they have paid for once the game dies. So games don't live forever. Even World of Warcraft will one day die. And the amount of money that people pay for costumes and buildings and lands and so forth will all go away when the game dies. That's not ethical. So here is what's, what's going to happen, right? Two things. Um, <laughs> Noah asked this question, and it, because Noah is looking, Noah is also pretty ahead of, of the curve when he was looking at NFTs. So I, was, I thought it was funny that we're both talking about it today. So first of all, let's define what a fungible token is and what is a non-fungible token. I'm sure you saw those words all over the media now. First of all, a fungible token is defined by its value in whatever its value is rather than by its properties, okay? So it, it's something that can be exchanged with something that's of similar value, similar object. So for example, I took this number this morning, right? Today at 7.20 a.m., one Ethereum is equivalent to $1,707.29. That's an exchange of one item to something else, right? So that's the fungible token. Uh, Bitcoins are fungible token. Cryptocurrencies are fungible token. Non-fungible token is not defined by the value of itself. It's defined by its unique properties. So properties that are associated with a physical object or a virtual object. The virtual object or physical object determines the value of the non-fungible token and that the token is also not interchangeable with something else. It's not, you can't just go, let me trade. It doesn't, doesn't work. So a famous, uh, re, uh, on February 24th, Beeple, who is only a virtual artist, so he does work in the virtual, just sold the NFT for his digital artwork for 6 .6, $6. $6.6 .6 million. And there's a bigger number. Yeah, there's a bigger number. As the NFT recognizes Beeple's digital artwork as being one of a kind that cannot be interchangeable with another digital object. Now we know that a value of something is based on scarcity. So what happens with associating an NFT with a digital art is that you might have 50 different copies of the digital art, but the original is what worth value. And that original is stamped with the hash value and also the provenance of the person who created it. That's essentially what it's doing. So it's doing something for digital art that we already do for physical art. That's why there's this craze right now. Um, if we have time, I'll talk about the uh, philosophy book that you should read to understand the NFT phenomenon, but let me just move on from this, okay? This is the last bit, I'm so sorry. That on the right hand side is CryptoKitties. So if you imagine the future that Microsoft rebuilds Minecraft, okay, just this is just imagine with me for a second. Microsoft decided to rebuild Minecraft with blockchain technology, and that the game now allows users to create NFTs of user created in game assets. A user can create her own one of a kind giant space hamster in Minecraft with blocks, right? In Minecraft creative mode and then record that giant space hamster as an MFT and sell that MFT on OpenSea.io, an NFT marketplace. So that's a real marketplace that you should take a look. Now, if even, let's say that Microsoft decided one day to convert Minecraft into an FTP game, right? With microtransactions, it doesn't really matter because users would be willing to spend that money because they would think that spending money inside Minecraft is an investment in the game. Because whatever you invest, let's say the artwork that you create in the game, you can actually sell it and recuperate some of the cost, or maybe even make more money out of the money that you spent into Minecraft. That is going to be the future of games. That's where I see it has to go. CryptoKitties is an example, right? Some CryptoKitties, and I have a few of them, some CryptoKitties by themselves are worth millions and people are still trading them on the Ethereum network. They're basically NFTs. People just didn't know they're called NFTs back then. So with this formula, if a game can actually give value to the players and when they're playing a game, they spend all the crazy money, but they can actually sell their user generated gaming asset using the tools inside the game, the player would not be resistant to spending money. The gaming industry can survive, right? And they wouldn't have to rely on so much on dark 
patterns to manipulate players to spend more money. So this is something I did in 2018. And I'm going to say that I don't just critique game design. I also use games to teach philosophy. So if you're interested, the link is there. I'm not going to say much more. And I will stop here because I talked for a very long time. The link to the slide is at the bottom, folks. So you can see slides. It says bit.ly slash ethical game design. And I was going to say, it's really funny that I could actually get that bit.ly link because usually when I try to get a bit.ly, I can't get, I can't get the URL. But I guess no one wants to talk about ethical game design because they don't think it's possible. I took on the bullseye. So that's the link, you have access to all this. So I will stop and uh, give the baton back to Ellen. People can ask questions. I know some people have to leave, so they left, but anybody who wants it. I think there was a question from Julia about what's the book, the philosophy book you mentioned. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, let me, uh, hold on one sec. So if you guys follow me, not that I'm asking you to follow me, not really. But if you follow me on Twitter, I posted the book on Twitter and it's basically philosopher Walter Benjamin's book. Um, uh, let me see, let me give you the full title, right? And the book is published in 1936 and it's called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. Thank you, Alan, yep. The Work of Art, I'm typing it in there. In the Age of Mechanical Reproduction by Walter Benjamin. It is some, it's a book that pretty much uh, students in humanities are mostly required to read, but it's so important to the NFT conversation. If you really want to understand what the heck is an NFT and why are people going crazy about it, study your history, study the philosophy. It actually has answers for you. So I posted on, on, uh, on Twitter, you guys can also see my Twitter and, and check that out. Let's see, let me see if I miss any other questions. Awesome, thanks. Um, I was wondering about the name of that book and I also have a ton of other questions, but I'll stick to one for right now. Um, so for your NFT solution to the dark patterns problem, do you think there's a legislative angle to that? Or are you picturing this being totally voluntary and people will use it because they can make money that way? That's a really good question. First of all, I don't even think, I'm, I'm really, dare I say, I really push the envelope when it comes to thinking about the future. The things that I talk about, most people don't touch it yet. So I really doubt that the senators even made a connection between NFT and games. Because I think is, you know, it's a picture. Most of them think it's a picture or a video, then you associate NFT. They never thought that you can actually redesign a whole game and using the, the in-game assets to create MFT, you know, artwork that can be associated with NFT. So I honestly am putting out a signal to the game design community to say, uh, save yourself. <laughs> Start thinking about how to convert your game. If you're still going to push that FT, F, F2P model, start to think about how to convert your game using blockchain technology. There are so many different platform solutions that people can learn how to rebuild their game that way. So dump, you know, whatever they were using, maybe they were using Unity or something. Uh, they need to create a whole new database, whole new database for their game so that they can survive. Because otherwise, I really do think that there's going to be another legislation, another act that will demonstrate the lack of knowledge. I don't mean want to be rude, but the, the PCAGA really demonstrate a lack of knowledge of what's going on in the industry. And it's going to be like that. There's going to be a part two to that kind of law. And at that point, the industry really will be hurting. So people need to save themselves. And it's going to be voluntary. I don't think anyone's going to force them to do it. But yeah. Cool, 
Should I answer? Let me see. Uh, let me jump to let me jump to Brody's question. So Brody, great question, man. Do you use Coinbase? I don't know if you guys use Coinbase, um, but let me open up. Hold on. So you know all these concerns. Those concerns are written by by journalists who don't really know technology. And you guys are in the tech field, you, you know this. <laughs> journalists are trying to do their very best to try to capture information, but there's a lot of articles written by journalists that doesn't really un show that understand something. And yes, absolutely, blockchain, forget NFT, people put the target at NFT, but the truth is blockchain, all blockchain consume tons of energy. It requires lots of service to run, to, to maintain all the, the, the registry. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a, a energy hungry monster. So there are people in the industry currently trying to create blockchain solutions that reduce environmental footprint. And the one that I recommend Brody to, to take a look, oh, what is it called? I just bought some, <laughs> there you go. Cardano, that's what it was. Cardano is very new and it touts itself as a major, major energy reducer. As in, it's very, it's very friendly to the environment. It already solved the problem. The issue would be for it to become popular. And right now, the reason why Cardano is not going to be as, as popular as Bitcoin for the moment is because you can't mine it. You can't get a physical machine to mine Cardano, but you can actually trade Cardano. And Cardano right now is, I'm not, I'm not getting anyone uh, stock or investment advice. Please don't come after me about that. I'm just letting you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm just uh, per ADA. So the coin is called ADA, ADA coin. So in China, they actually call it ADA. They don't call it Cardano. Cardano is the official name but ADA is the coin. And Cardano, if you read the research, it's created by three uh, scientists. One of the scientists is actually from MIT. So it's very, very well researched. It is not just made by Silicon Valley folks, but actually academics who are trying to change the blockchain game. So any kind of uh, problem that you point out, those are valid problems, but understand that the community is trying to make projects to fix some of those problems. So I don't see, in a year or two that the environmental impact will be as big if the developer keep on trying to fix the problem. So take a look at Cardano. Oh, thank you, Alan. Was there any, any other question that I missed? Yeah, Sherry, I have one. Okay. Um, I'm curious about this like attention economy um, advertisement based business model that games will use. How would you describe those dark patterns that are like, oh, to advance to the next level or to get the rewards or whatever in the game, you have to watch all these ads, right? What, tell me about how that works. That is still the, the that is still manipulating behavior. That is still manipulating behavior, but it's, it's more, I would classify it under grinding to be honest, because you're not, the player's not spending money, but they're watching an ad and they're doing this by repetition, right? Repeatedly. And the person who's, the, the, the people who are making money is the game developers, because every time you watch an ad, they make money. So the player's not spending any money in there. So it wouldn't be a monetary one, but I would probably say it's closer to temporal uh, grinding. It wastes the player's time and the player's just spending a bunch of time so they could, you know, rack up something uh, for the developers. It was that was that the only question? Did I answer everything? Yeah, I was just trying to understand how the numbers add up for how much money these games are making. And so I was suspecting that the, the ad revenue is a big part of it. So just trying to put the pieces together for an unfamiliar subject for myself. <laughs> well, the ads, so here's the thing that people don't understand. So Google basically controlled the ad landscape with ad, uh, Google AdSense, right? So Google AdSense is basically, depending on how popular your site is, your website, your blog or something, depending on how many visitors, right, visit your site, 
Google would naturally say, oh, you have this many people, here are the amount of ads that we will run. So it select the, the, the ads also based on who is looking at the ads. So it's all based on algorithms that automatically feed based on the user's cookies, right? So it feeds, feeds it. So the more people visit the game, obviously the more money the game developers make. So I don't remember what the current, somebody can correct me. I don't, I don't remember what the current Google AdSense is like four cents per visit or something, which is ridiculous because if uh, Empires and Puzzle, which is a game that I'm currently playing and researching on, let's say they have, you know, simultaneously 300,000, uh, I mean, yeah, 300,000 people uh, visiting it every hour. So every, I'm, I'm giving a low ballpark number, right? But 300,000 people visiting the game within, within an hour, okay, every hour simultaneously and they're looking at ads and some of the ads repeat like once or twice and each ad they might have three or four ads within a collection you can start to do the math and see how it goes very very quickly that they're making tons of money and remember it's non-stop it, it starts from morning to night it's 24 hours it doesn't stop at all and empires and puzzle also also have players from all over the globe so i see I can see that most of their money, like a big chunk of their money is from advertising and they're being paid by Google assets. Anybody else? I have a more philosophical question for you if we have time for it. Sure, I'm, I have time, yep. Okay, cool. Um, so you were talking about the lack of transparency and how that can be a problem, like when you're buying loot crates and you don't know what's gonna be in there and stuff like that. But it also seems to me like um, a lack of transparency is it an essential part of game design in some ways, because not knowing what's going to happen when you do something is like how you create surprises and make your game not predictable. So I'm wondering if you've thought about like how you would define the line between good transparency and bad transparency. <laughs> um, so have you thought about that? Oh, of, of course, as a game designer, you have to think about that. So rules are a little bit different than events. So there are game events and there are game rules. So let's break it down to the fundamentals so we can understand this together, right? So if you buy uh, a board game, board game usually come with a manual and it will explain all the rules of the game so you, you, don't, you know exactly how to play it. But in terms of what happens in the game, maybe it's controlled by dice. So there's randomness, right, in the game. So the events that happen are not going to be calculated by the rules. So rules are just foundation to say, this is how you play the game. But what happens during the gameplay, that's always going to be a surprise. That's accidental. And that's the fun part of playing a game. So any game should tell you all the rules ahead of time, not the events. Then they're going to say, oh, there's going to be a, there's going to be a monster that show up and it's going to come and like you know, kidnap the villagers. It's not going to tell you that. That's story elements. That's our events elements. Um, so in terms of the loot box problem, surprises are good, but not when there's a lot of money at stake. <laughs> that means there are people, young children, spending $1,000 for a loot box, okay? So we're talking about physical one. The digital one is a similar problem. But they spend $1,000 for a loot box and then they get a loot box that basically contain maybe $50 worth of value. There is a real problem when there's money associated with this kind of surprise, okay? That is manipulation, that is deception. You can have all kinds of surprises you want in a game. In fact, I like surprises in a game, but when you're telling me I have to pay $1,500 or whatever it is to get a surprise, and that surprise often means I got robbed, there is a problem. That's what we're talking about. So I totally agree with you that a game need to have elements of surprise, but not when they associate 
big chunks of money and prey on children who don't really know how to do math calculations or never think about how much you're spending every day on the game and how much you're spending directly. And we know that parents, some parents kind of leave credit cards to the little kids. So the kids would just, you know, pay with their fingerprint or something and they just immediately spend a ton of money. That's a problem. This is what the, the bill the bills we're trying to address is that young children are constantly being preyed on. And honestly, as some adults are not good at math either, <laughs> they're, they're getting robbed left and right. So the conversation really is about the money, the amount of money that's being stolen from players. So then that makes it sound like transparency is not so much the issue. And it's more about that people are paying for something that's not worth what they're paying for it. That's a big part. That's a big part. But the rules should always be transparent, though. The rules should always be transparent in that if the game says the rewards, which I think they should be doing, they should be saying that the rewards are um, on variable schedule, variable ratio schedule. That means uh, it's not going to come up every two hours. Sorry. It's going to come on random times. Understand that this is, this is what you agree to. That is not going to kill the player or destroy their game if they reveal that. But some players don't know that. So they think is they, they, they players are superstitious. So they think there's a magical number. And they say, oh, every fifth hour, this will show up. That is the type of manipulation that I want to reduce in the industry. And I've been talking to game designers about being more open and revealing about their rules. Events, we don't have a problem. It's the rules that should be laid bare. So the player know what they're getting into. And if they're willing to play a game that has a variable, uh, rewards, I mean, ratio release schedule, then no one will be complaining because they know what they're getting into. But it's kind of like a EULA that's incomplete. A game is a piece of software and it really should be telling people what all the rules are. Um, that is kind of important. Even with the loot boxes, they should say, you know what? Sometimes you spend a thousand bucks and sometimes you might get $50 worth of stuff back. It's a form of gambling. This is why there's going to be legislation that's going to go after loot boxes. It's, it's a major gambling front. So, yeah. Yep, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for you, Ms. Jones. Sure. Um, not so much microtransactions, but what are your thoughts on like DLC once a game's already been produced and you paid $60 for it and then six months later they put out another DLC that's $30 and people are super upset by that. Do you find that like, I mean, if it adds to the game and people enjoy the game and it it's another chunk of it, but I, I, I don't know. I see a lot of people get really upset. And they're like, they should have included that or the game wasn't complete when they put it out and we paid $60 for it. Um, do you find that that's deception or, or they're just making it better and they're adding to the story? Or they're still working on it one, before they've, uh, they put it out and it wasn't done. I don't know. So Shane, that's, that's a good scenario to think about. I personally don't think there's anything wrong with a model, but the reason why people are so upset with it is because free to play games flood the market. They expect games to be free and there is a psychological phenomenon with people thinking that digital means free. Back in the day, you have people pirating MP3s, you know, they're pirating music on Napster and all kinds of stuff like, uh, you know, uh, P2P exchanges of, of um, free stuff. So when people think of digital, they think it has to be free. So when a company is trying to do right by the play and say, okay, we release a game, but there's good, there's improvement because you guys want improvement, right? So we made the release, but we're not going to work for free. So that's going to be 30 bucks tacked on. Players get very upset. I get that. But the flip coin to this equation is, let me give you stats. Let me give you stats. For a free to play game, the average player, the ones who are paying money, pays $15,000 on the average for the lifetime of the game. So that means not, not that the game's going to be around. So let's say the game's going to be out 10 years. We're not saying that the player will stay for 10 years and pay, pay $15,000. We're saying that the player might pay for two years 
and pay $15,000. Comparison to spending, I don't know, I, like I said, Shane, I don't, I don't know about how much the game you're playing costs, right? So maybe it's 50 bucks at the beginning, then you're paying 30. In comparison, DLCs have nothing, cannot even touch the cost of uh, free to play games, which are pretty evil. There is a Alliance member that uh, I'm playing with and he spends a regularly about $5,000 a month on Empires and Puzzle, that game that I showed you every single month. I don't know what he's doing with his life, but he's okay with that. Um, so there are real whales of people playing this and I'm not, you know, as a professor, I don't have that kind of money. I just stare and record and research. <laughs> it's very interesting. But in your scenario, I get why people are upset, but it's this weird association with it. It's digital, so it must be free. That's why the MFT tokens will change the conversation, really change it when digital things are going to become rare and they have a real value associated with them. You don't see any problem with, with like a true DLC addition if it really is like, a good addition to an already complete game, right? And play, and like, I don't know, I, I play a lot of console games. I don't play free to play games, but um, I'll buy the DLC. Like if I, if it's a game that I like and I don't have a problem paying $30 for it, but I, I see a lot of backlash on the internet when they announce this DLC and it's gonna be 30 bucks. Uh, I don't know. Uh, then people jump right to the game wasn't complete when when really i i see it as they were just making they were improving upon a, a chunk of the story that you know that wasn't there in the first place or they're just adding to it i don't know i don't see a problem with it but i was just curious if you right. see that as, as I don't, uh, um, um, a way to make more money or if they're just really trying to improve the game look if look there are always exceptions to the rule i mean if if somebody release a game that's so very broken that you can't even finish a level, then I, I get that that's deception, right? Where, where you have to buy the DLC in order to pass levels. But based on your experience, it sounds like the game's fairly complete and it was up to you that the game will still continue to play whether or not you buy the DLC, uh, but you bought the DLC so you can enhance the gameplay. I don't see that as a major problem. I mean, when we go, hey, I, I go play Pup Pot because <laughs> it's less dangerous for me. At least I'm walking around or something. So I go play putt-putt. Every time I go play putt-putt, it's what, $30, $40, wherever we go. And it's not like I get to bring the golf club or the, the, the ball back. So when I think about a game and I pay for it and it still stick around with me, I find it to be fairly valuable. It's just that people got to divorce this idea that digital means it's free. And we're in that moment. That's because of the way the internet designed. The internet currently is called Internet 1.0. It's really outdated. Google knows this. Google Google's search engine is really broke, right? It's, it doesn't, you know, it's still working. So Google's solution is to use artificial intelligence to improve it. They're gambling on AI rather than blockchain. So I'm very interested to see what's going to happen to, to Google's search engine, which are currently, uh, you know, improving versus a blockchain-based internet, which is what the blockchain folks want to happen. Um, but once, if everything is blockchain, which will convert to one, uh, internet 2.0 or web, web 3.0, um, the rarity will, will come up. And I think that once people think digital does not mean it's free, then the whole DLC problem you're talking about will kind of slowly go away too. There's a relationship there. I'm just um, smiling at the comment about digital is not free because people cannot see things, so they just think it's free. So, so for example, people say, "Hey, can you can you do the design of this website or do the graphic design for me?" And of course, they think it's free. You're so creative; you could just do it. And so, it's not tangible. <laughs> you send the file digitally. People just think that um, oh, that's so easy for you, and they discounted the fact that you're spending hours making it, you have to think, you have to do iterations. So I think that the concept about what is worth money sometimes is very different in people's perception. It's like, oh, you're so, you're so good at drawing. So I think you can do this painting for me for free. <laughs> Perfect.
you you know this is very very well i mean the, the artists designers are always being looked down upon no one knows how much they work i mean there's this concept that if you have software people don't see the back end of the software so they don't see the algorithm so they think it's the way software work yeah it's free and it's magic like it just works <laughs> you know right and people spend hours <laughs> tens of thousands of hours working on it and yeah i think we got, oh, got spoiled definitely i also like things that are free and yes i do complain <laughs> as well i mean i'm on the both sides right i'm saying wait you want me to do all those things for free at the other side i say well, why can't i get this for free right no that's right i agree with you definitely and i think honestly i think that 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 you should if you do artwork if everyone in here do artwork you should probably start putting them on NFT. I'm actually converting some of my writings into NFT. You can actually store articles, journals, papers, presentations of NFT. So you might as well just coin one and see what happens. <laughs> I would. That's very interesting. I never thought about that. I never thought about money. I, I thought as long as I work, there's money. And so I don't have to worry about it. But then it is ridiculous. Somebody can just throw away like $5,000 or, or more. <laughs> monthly it's like where did they get the money right right no so this is i know it's not directly related but i saw their lawsuit for the student to be suing university say hey i need my tuition back well but so where would the tuition come from i mean i did not work any less i actually work a lot more after zoom so it's not my choice that i have to do online and i ended up preparing more i meeting with every single students so in the past some other thing can happen in in the space, people saw it, it's done in five minutes and now everything has to be scheduled and gets complicated. Yeah. Perfect example. I totally can agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I understand you say I'm not getting the right treatment. I need to refund money back. But I think all the people who are serving the staff and the, the faculty, they actually do extra work or two times work. I mean, today I have what, seven zoom meeting yesterday i have eight so i oh, didn't gosh. have to do that <laughs> oh gosh, i'm so sorry oh <laughs> sorry <laughs> you just got got me on the soapbox i was like i understand the situation but this is a lose lose situation because i don't think we as a teacher actually put in less time we actually put in more time we, we i i haven't had much sleep I'm more busy during the pandemic than 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 before yes. the pandemic. I don't have time to sleep, really. <laughs> True. Well, thank you. Thank you for a good talk. Um, I have to leave. I have a meeting. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. And yes, this will be posted on the web, and I will send you the link as well. Okay. Thank you, everybody. It's nice meeting all. Bye. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. It was good. We got lots of questions.